Okay, now you're ready? Perfect. If you're ready, I'm ready. That means we are officially ready. Let's do this. Welcome in, everyone. Welcome to the Snap Judgments League. For those who do not know, my name is Guest, also known as It's Guest Gaming, and we are here live on Twitch casting some of the games that have already happened. So this is a past playback of games that are going on for the Snap Judgments League. So here's what you need to know. We're gonna be broadcasting things that have happened in the past. So if you're here with us live here on Twitch, I'm seeing this for the very first time. You may know results and it's irrelevant to me because I make it a proactive effort to not look at any of these games whatsoever. So there's a couple of things I need you to understand going into today's broadcast. Number one, if you know a result, if you say it in the chat, I'm not going to judge you. The reason being is because I'm gonna be casting the action here as I see it happen. Number two, we're not gonna to get to every single game that has ever been submit every single week. So we're gonna be showcasing different games and different players every week. So if you want to have your game cast here, join us here on Fridays. Let me know that you're here in the chat and that your matchup did happen so that way we can guarantee that it'll be showcased here on stream because I don't know how long we're gonna be doing this for. We'll just do it for as long as we feel appropriate because there's a lot of really cool names that we wanna see. A lot of people that have never had an opportunity to be broadcast and showcase what they can do on, on, on any kind of platform, whether it be Twitch, whether it be YouTube, whether it be whatever. So this is an opportunity for new members of the community to showcase what they have in a very public forum with the Snap Judgments League. For more information, take a look down in the YouTube description below for links to future events because this is season one, right? This is just season one. We are season one, week one, showcasing some intro matches to let you know what we have to offer here at the Snap Judgments League. So first and foremost, send all of the hype and all of the thanks to everyone behind the scenes that has been putting this together. You know the public face, for example, of Gunny. You know Pulse Glazer. You've probably seen models. You've seen chat. You've seen all these people on the back end pushing and pushing and put Mike, for example, like pushing and pushing to get this to happen, an incredibly detailed Discord, communication, meetings, organization. I, and, and I know I'm missing people and forgive me in that process because there's people even on the staff like Savage Yeti who's also doing YouTube content. And um, oh my gosh, Doug Pie is a part of the content. Like there's so many people involved with making this kind of production a huge deal that for me to come on in and just be a caster and to sh showcase some fun games that you all have put together on the back end of this. This is a lot of fun. So I love casting. I love being a part of this. I'm glad you all are here and are gonna be a part of it with me. So I'm gonna play favorites to start us off. So I'm gonna play favorites. We're gonna go into a match that, because I'm gonna play favorites, I, I think is appropriate. Let's switch on over. The opening match is gonna be my boy, Super Tech God because I love Ken. I've given him a lot of crap the last few days just because I love him. He's my man, but he has submit his matchup and we're going to be showcasing him first, okay? It's him versus Kawa Plays for the opening premiere match today. So I'm watching this playback for the very first time. I don't know what's gonna happen. All of these matches and it look, it, from the production standpoint, I may like have to size windows and stuff and make it look pretty and every now and then. And some people like Super Tech God, you know, he's doing his matchup and he was probably live on stream. You can see from his full layout. Bear with me, bear with it. Sometimes we'll see more information, sometimes we won't. It depends on what each player has submit to the Snap Judgments League. So if we end up with a recording that has a full broadcast, a full layover just for DMCA purposes, I can't showcase the full routine. However, what I can do is lay myself over the top here, take a look at what's gonna happen, and tell you that the Snap Judgments League is officially off and running. Week one, let's go. It's STG, the Super Tech God, also known as Ken, versus Kawa Plays as Hub, and Central Park brings us in to start. And it looks like STG brings, I believe this is the deck he used to take to get to Infinite. 
uh, into battle right off the bat because I see the Zabu, the Mr. Negative, Super Scrawl. This is Negative Tribunal almost guaranteed. So, look, anytime you get an opening combo of Zabu into Negative, you've got to call it a good day. So, start it off, Zabu, Negative. Throw in the magic and... Ooh, careful with that Electra there because Electra is already is going to backfire because they're going to be playing Hope Summers, the brand new season pass card. And I like the clog idea of leaving the middle squirrel. There's no reason to give them more energy. If you there's please don't nix that squirrel, but at the same time, they're kind of sitting at a deficit because they'll have that extra turn. But Ken's then got to figure out how they're going to augment everything else. The blue Marvel's going to be able to do so. But with hope on the board, we don't know what else, what else to go. What else is going to stack on top? Um, that's a very interesting choice. Uh, not the fact that they're playing Ms. Marvel, but the fact that they're willingly rocking the Pixie. Um, the Pixel variant is a very specific choice. And we see a snap. Snap coming in from Kawa's side right off the bat. And Ken's got to be careful here with this Super Skull if he's going to take on the Ms. Marvel effect. Because if he needs to spread, spread these resources, you've got to now maintain the Ms. Marvel balance of one of different costs in each lane. So, hmm. Okay. I think the fact that he specifically pulled Tribunal right now is why Super Scroll would come on down. Because otherwise, it's a really solid play to pull on out later on. But the Iron Lad comes from Kawa's side, who puts out a Rock Slide onto the board. So we're probably looking at a Dark Hawk package simultaneously, which is really going to feed heavily into that Super Scroll. And a snap back right away with Sarah also on the board. You gotta feel good going into that with a reduced Sarah plus Ms. Marvel, and you know they have the chance at pulling putting out their Dark Hawk too. Yeah, I don't know if Electra is actually going to be your best friend right now. If they're banking on leaving that squirrel there, there's another Rock Slide coming down. One, two. And Shadow King just for stats, unfortunately, because here comes the double reinforcement. Keeps the full balance and spread. And they pull their flipped Iron Man to boot. Look at the stack. This is for eight cubes right away? You guys went for an eight cube match in week one, round one, match one? Ken submit. Ken's already in. I mean, this is a very precarious situation because Kawa coming on top of that. Super Scroll still keep it, is still gonna keep the bonus in the right hand side, and they go for it. Iron Man drops on into limbo, gives in the 0-5 negative reinforcement as Tribunal stacks on top of that, spreads everything across the board, putting. 27 into each lane, 29 once the reinforcement on Electra hits. There goes the Enchantress who drops down onto the hub, removing out the Blue Marvel and the Mystique. That's going to tremendously hurt every lane down to 19 a pop, but it is not enough. It is not enough as Jeff drops into the middle and STG comes in with an 8 cube win over Kawa plays right away in round one. Right away into round number one. Kawa's now got a huge comeback potentially ahead of him to knock this out. And as he well should, SCG does a great tactic here. Immediately, turn one snap. You're in low stakes. You should be forced. You have the cubes to go with. You should be forcing your opponent to look at what could potentially come based on their opening hand for the next two rounds. But now it's all gone to absolute crap because look, District X pops into the mid. SGG was feeling really good with the Sarah in hand. This is the Super Scrawl in hand. Knew you could steal things. 
Yeah, about that. <sighs> that doesn't feel good. But Kawa did open up with Hope Summers having to dance around the squirrels a second time, losing one of those manas. That's an anno that's a nuisance to say the minimum. And a risky Moon Knight from SCG as he loses his Super Scrawl in the process, and Kawa loses a Galactus pulled out of District decks. Iron Lad pulls a copy of Sunspot in the deck, so a pretty weak turn five pull from Kawa who's going to have to really have a nice stack probably in the subterranean lane to catch back up. There's your flip. Sarah into the mid, giving an advantage. There's a Sunspot and a Star Lord. So advantage right now, barely on the side of Kawa via Tiebreaker, but does have seven energy to work with. Cerebro is drawn which will reinforce the Sarah specifically. It's a tall lane stack as Dr. Doom comes into the mid, spreads power all across the board. That's eight into Subterranea and nine in Central Park. That's gonna be enough to hold off the two sides and still wins by one. So Kawa does hold on to two cubes, moves into round number three at a deficit of eight to two. We open up round three with Machine World on the left, but they are, Ken is starting with Mr. Negative in hand. Still no Accelerator though, no Zabu, no Magic to help guarantee that negative line feeling good. Sarah on, on the pole still doesn't bode too well right now. And a Crimson Cosmos as the final pull. Not a great opening round as we see the full flush of locations. And Ken does the good thing here and just skips, just a straight up skip. A turn four magic never feels good on a negative deck, knowing that you are sitting on a full hand of non-negative cards. He's now in a deficit, but if you look at the cards that are remaining in his deck as he goes in for the snap, Pulling out that 0-5 Iron Man and that 3-5 Blue Marvel could be the saving grace. And with Kawa down to two cubes, I'm totally on board with that call of go ahead and try and snap it out one more time. Iron Lad again hits the Rock Slide in the right as Magic flips over that Bar Sinister into Limbo. And we got a Rock. And he avoids the negative line, instead decides to drop down Jubilee into Machine World, contesting against the Rock Slide and Jeff in Limbo. Jubilee is going to pop out a rock, which has got to feel good for Kawa, who's holding on to his tournament life right now. As Ken's just looking to scrape something together, considering that he's already got Kawa in for two, you might as well pull something. So plop down a Sarah, and then you can play three cards on the final turn, potentially. Nah, he doesn't like anything. He does, even for two in, it doesn't matter. Just save time, save, save your efforts, your mentality, your resources, and just move on. Round four, this is the end of the low stakes. If there's any kind of strength in Ken's hand, do not be surprised if we see another early snap. No power accelerators yet. No Zabu or there's your magic. Okay, magic's got to feel good. If we see an, a negative get pulled and Kawa goes for the snap. Kawa goes for the snap on round four here. Interesting. And a Nova Roma pull, but still no negative. Still no negative. Ken doesn't want to risk anything whatsoever, though. He's going to remove the expansion as the rock slide comes out into Nova Roma. Okay. Can they pull their top deck negative on four? No, they do not. 
Super Scroll in hand has got to feel good, especially because we still haven't seen a Dark Hawk get pulled out. But if they're playing the Korg Rock Slide package, there's no reason. Uh, there's no reason not to. Hope Summers drops into Vibranium Mines. I'm a little shocked at the location pull on that as Jubilee, who is really enjoying these rocks, continues to pull them and Ken still can't pull a negative to save his life in the last three rounds. Sarah's going to have to be the call into Limbo as Ms. Marvel makes her appearance into the Vibranium Mines. This is a tough call here. Iron Lad now comes on down. We know it ain't going to hit the Rock Slide for once. Instead, it copies the Vibranium, which both cards are then going to activate the Hope Summers, sorry, the Ms. Marvel pull from the center lane. And now on the final turn, you get your top decking of negative. But we have a double activated Sarah at the moment to work with. So Ken's just trying to figure out where we can get the strongest amount of resource into any given lane. And he's leaning towards trying to steal the mid by doubling up Iron Man. Now, those rocks do have value if you are going to play down your Marvel. Look at the stack potential here. You have what looks like only one power in Nova Roma, but watch how that finishes out as Eliath comes into Limbo, makes his appearance, and the purple fart cloud controls the battlefield one more time. One more time, the purple cloud comes over the top and casseroles Ken for another two cubes. Coming back piece by piece by piece. It is looking tighter and tighter and tighter as STG now has a 4-2 layover. Elysium has got to feel good for Ken right now. And for the first time, Ken's going to be rocking out that golden Cosmo. Hope Summer is into Elysium with Shadow King just to get the activation right off the bat. Kawa then going into turn four with five energy on an Elysium match. We could see Dr. Doom potentially drop on down right away. And I like the call here that Ken's looking at of doubling up on that Cosmo. We've seen from Kawa a lot of on reveals need to be activated. So I do like this play. They pop out their rock slide bright and early into the center lane. Iron Lad comes on down and activates as a Ms. Marvel. So they've got the full stack right now over in Elysium. So Ms. Marvel's going to have a double activation reinforcement. Sarah comes in. Jubilee gets the extra buff from Quantum Realm. So it does give a point advantage temporarily over to Ken. But Iron Lad now knowing that that's available to them. That Super Scroll's really looking to feast big. Uh, I would even contemplate that Onslaught going down on top of the Super Scroll at this moment. But instead, he plops down the rock just for power and is banking on the Iron Man to partner with the Blue Marvel, potentially. As the Super Tech God himself comes on down and joins us here live on stream, resubscribing once again. Thank you so much. You've moved up to one year here on the guest list. Thank you so much, STG. We're broadcasting it right now. And for the first time, Kawa drops a vision into play. We've seen almost the entire deck minus Darkhawk. 
it's showing lots of rocks, but no Darkhawk yet. And when all is said and done, Ken's trying to take out Kawa right now. With this final blue marvel getting a double reinforcement off of that onslaught. It's a safely protected card, but we know that Kawa is still also holding on to another Ms. Marvel. Now, Super Scroll is going to take on both of them from Iron Lad and from Super Sc and from the actual M Ms. Marvel if it drops on down simultaneously. So he's just stacking mid. It's mid and right. He's sacrificed the left entirely, not putting a second card into Hell's Kitchen to take the point advantage using the rock in the center. Kawa is playing from behind, and this is potentially the last moment for Kawa in this matchup. Let's find out. Does he send it? There they go. There's the blue marvel. Double reinforcing into the Elysium, which stacks over. Gives Elysium back over to Kawa. The Darkhawk activates. The two Iron Lads activate. And Kawa hangs on by one in the Cosmo Lane of Hell's Kitchen. Holds on by one. And with four games in a row, Kawa has come back after an eight cube loss opener. What an opening match here. What an opening match here for the Snap Judgments League. It is now the final round for Super Tech God versus Kawa Plays. Here they go. We open up with a Clintar and a Los Diablo space to, to start. Oh, that's a scary location for Super Tech God. That's a scary location for Super Tech God because there's a lot of good epic things that can come from that. And I like the protection of plop down Cosmo with Iron Mad. It's, it, it's too important knowing that there's Enchantress in your opponent's deck. That's absolutely too important to not have at this point. So I'm definitely a fan here of that call. Wow. Kawa has really played this incredibly strong with full comfort of really navigating the options of how Ms. Marvel is going to interact. That's one of the biggest things we should take away from this matchup so far. As Kawa opens up with that vision to start us off and Klintar stays, so that does limit a little bit of the location play out for Ken because he can't start to do some of those ongoing early stacks in the center lane. Sitting on a Jubilee, you could play it in the mid, but you really need that mid power also. Knowing that also Cosmo was played second, Jubilee becomes a little bit of a risk if they do end up pulling Mystique, for example, because it's going to hit the Cosmo and not the Iron Man. Hope Summers drops into Los Diablos, but Ken goes for the full skip instead, letting Clintar finish and do its thing. And now you've got a really tough call here. You've got four very strong plays here for turn five. There's no magic. You could try to risk for the magic, but there's no magic on the board at the moment. And STG decides to stack big in the ruins first. No? Second guessing? Yeah, he's he's struggling right now. He's struggling to figure out because there's a couple of different options here, right? You could go for your energy cheat, but what are your options from there? Blue Marvel into Jubilee or Blue Marvel into Super Scroll, depending on what they drop. If you go with the Blue Marvel first, though, you reinforce the ruins. You choose to throw your priority and just say that I'm looking at a big stack here and that if I'm going to do anything further, it might just be let me stack the Living Tribunal in there. 16 will turn into... 8 and 10 and 18 times 2 is 38 plus 3, 41 divided over. 41 divided over. I don't know if that's going to be enough. 41 divided by 3, that's going to end up as 14 in each lane. 
I don't know if that's going to be enough because the symbiote counts as a four cost card in Clintar. We could still see Ms. Marvel also get procced if we see a Ms. Marvel plus vision movement into another lane. Both players going for the knockout. Right here, it's the final two cubes for each of them. Ka was thinking, how do I dance around this? Because there's the threat of Super Scroll with almost any ongoing he chooses to play. With Kawa having priority, plus having an Eliath in hand, it's a scary move to see STG put one card on the board and bank it all on the Tribunal. But Kazuo's in there actually at correction, so that will defend it. So you're looking most likely at a Darkhawk stack. You're looking at a Ms. Marvel stack. Iron Lad with a little bit of luck. There's several things that could go wrong here, but there's only one card in the mid, and it's the Doctor Doom for extra power to spread it wide, and that'll do it. Kawa comes so close. He comes back grinding and grinding and grinding, but cannot take down the Living Tribunal in a very, very close matchup. Looking at the final score, two cubes remaining for Ken and Kawa gets brought down. We got to give Kawa plays a huge shout out. That was a great, great comeback made for such an exciting opening match to start us off. That was cool. That was cool. I hope you all enjoyed the opening match right there because that was a lot of fun to get us started. That was a lot of fun to get us started right off the bat. What'd you all think of it here in the live chat? Ken, I know you're here hanging out with us. Thank you again also for resubscribing one year here on Twitch. I appreciate you. I cheers you. I commend you. That was a tough one. The, the up and down of negative tribunal. I know that was your negative deck. Uh, that you took to infinite so i'm not surprised that you decided to take that one into your opening round here today too so here's what we're gonna do we will be right back ladies and gentlemen we're gonna take a quick short break and re-resume after these ads from twitch play your old arrow is almost back all right to welcome back welcome back we are taking a look here on the back end and trying to choose our next match to showcase here Surprise here at the attacks. snap judgments league welcome on in monkeys with the raid thank you so much everyone refresh your stream let's take a look at i know they were also here in the chat as well so let's showcase the matchup here of gnome versus the king of canada so we're gonna bring gnome and the king of canada up on the board i know king is a regular here also on the guest list so let's go ahead and bring that up to be right now that'll be our second matchup we're gonna structure that out it's gnome versus king of canada i'm gonna resize it as we go live Almost fit. T. <laughs> Professional streamer, as always. There we go. That looks pretty good to me. Don't, wouldn't you say? I think so, too. Let's go. Gnome versus the King of Canada. Opening up with Lemuria and Machine World as our first two locations. And Gnome looks to be coming on in with a bounce deck. Spider-Ham hits Thor against the King of Canada. And... Yeah, Spider-Man, uh, sorry, excuse me, Spider-Ham, Bast, King, Kitty Pride, Mysterio, Bishop, Hitmonkey, going in with a full Bishop stack into Crown City as the third location. Yeah, I totally can understand and respect that decision 1,000%. And Crown City, one of the newer locations that has just recently dropped into Marvel Snap, is a very treacherous location in the sense of it's that Baxter building style of feel 
but you can play around it if you choose to very early on in your adventure of that round. If you decide that you're going to forego Crown City, knowing that you're going into a four-point deficit in one or potentially two lanes, it's a great strategy. But in this case, that's a lot harder to dance around because we have Machine World to deal with. And you could try to contest against it, but you're giving everything to your opponent. Kitty Pride gets a bounce over into Lemuria as Beta Ray Bill makes his first appearance in Crown City, switching that plus four to the Canada the, to the Canadian border. Falcon in the mid to rebounce that Spider Ham, Bast, and Snow Guard back into the hand. It's a lot of cards, but because they're already sitting on six of them, so they've got to dump a little more out. Do you do it via? Because something's going to get stuck. That's the problem here. Something's going to get stuck here because you're going to bounce three cards back into your hand. You're going to lose a card draw if you play that Falcon. So it has to be worth your while knowing that you're going to play all of these big cards going into the final turn. They make the call. The Jane Foster comes down from the Canadian border. And Snowguard Bear switching that activation to the opposite side. They leave their Falcon in their hand and choose to <coughs> exclusively bounce the Kitty Pride for an extra power on the on this turn. Now, with Hit Monkey in hand and Bishop and Mysterio, your biggest point spread, because the Bass is already activated onto the Mysterio is to dance around the Mysterio bounce, the Mysterio, excuse me, the Mysterio power, right? And it looks like they're gonna be going for exactly what I mentioned in the very beginning of this round, which is dancing around Crown City right off the bat. If we dance around the Crown City right off the bat, knowing that that's the game plan by putting seven into Machine World, that could be strong enough, even with a plus four via the Crown City, excuse me, 10, not seven. Because there's your hit monkey popping on down, stacking over in the Lemuria for a, a 10 power hit monkey. All of the threes of the Mysterios drop on in. Bishop's going to stack one by one by one, temporarily leaving Crown City in benefit for uh, themselves. But there's a Spider Man 2099 and a Ghost Spider who hits a big old bear. Whoa! Yo, we've got Spider-Man 2099 gaming right now, y'all. Even though it didn't take down the round, the King of Canada, who loves to come in with crazy combos, has brought in a Hammers and Webs deck, is what we're going to call it, with Spider-Man 2099, Ghost Spider, and some RNG to hopefully buy them some cubes. Well... Okay, I wasn't expecting, I know, if you were expecting that one, let me know in the chat because I'm pretty sure no one's gonna say that they were. That's fun. That's a lot of fun. And a goose from the King of Canada too. I mean, that's not gonna do much against this bounce deck because literally every single card in, their, in, a, in Gnome's hand is three cost or less, but... I mean, Canada, my, it's only going to be a restrictor for Canada. That's it. He is negatively using Goose the entire game now. And Storm. Wow, King of Canada really cooking here. Storm, Lockout, Goose, with Spider-Man 2099 to boot. Like, all right. I'm here for it. Tough call here, because you're sitting on the storm thinking that most likely Canada's probably going to play it on down. So playing out the bishop, if you can snipe it into that storm lane, would be incredibly strong. But he goes for the right, thinking storm could be right. Looks like Gnome's a little shocked there. With the storm going down onto the left, specifically in the collector lane, is a very unique call. Neither player with the thought or luxury that they should storm the dream dimension is very surprising. 
on that turn to lock it down in hopes that they don't have to pay extra for their cards next turn. But instead, going for the Storm Lockout in the Flooding, it looks like, based on what we know from Canada so far, potentially a Beta Ray Bill could drop into that lane as a late stack potential play. Bast is going to bounce back into the hand. There goes your Snow Guard to stay on the board for three, ramp up the Collector a little further, and bounce the Kitty Pride one more time. There's the Beta Ray Bill over into the Flooding, so you're looking at a potential double up. This could be where we see Jane Foster plop down if it wasn't for the Dream Dimension. So now you're high rolling. You're high rolling your hammers, hoping that you have an opportunity to draw it in the next two turns. There's five cards, sorry, six cards were in the deck when that happened. You did your draw for turn five. And now you've got to play around it. But if you're Canada, are you banking on that snow guard potentially coming down? There's your Hawk, which is going to open the Flooded back up for one more turn. And a Baby Thor into the mid. Playing from behind in all three lanes now. Canada's banking on random hammers being drawn via RNG. On the last turn, he had a 33% chance to pull a hammer out at any given point. And now, as Gnome stacks a load of cards, he's trying to factor in four cards dropping. That's going to make your Hit Monkey grow to eight when all is said and done. The hood's going to explode. Nico Minoru does just her standard two power, but Bishop's also going to go up four. So if you're going up four plus two, that's 13 into the Daily Bugle. You're adding eight into Flooded. No cards are going to be bouncing back to reinforce the collector. So you have 18 into the left and 14 into the right as everything unfolds. There's your... Oh, sorry. It's a demon. I thought it was a destroy. Really reinforcing that mid there with a great spell cast via Nika Minoru. As Spider-Man 2099 comes down, there's the ghost spider trying to hit big. Does it? It does! It takes down the Bishop in the Daily Bugle and Stormbreaker to go back over the top in Flooded. No, it's not enough because the Hit Monkey stays big and tall. Big and tall for the win in the Flooded trying to play on over there, but a great hit from that Spider-Man 2099. He actually got the full value out of it he needed, but it wasn't enough to go over the top via the Hit Monkey in the left. Great reopening and use of Snow Guard there, knowing that there's a potential for that style of stack and going over the top and mitigated that risk as we see a snap come on down right away with the White Hot Room immediately. And if I were the King of Canada, I believe that was Gnome who did the snap. If I'm the King of Canada with that deck in particular, I'm running from the White Hot Room furiously. Casting on the Mysterio on turn one has always got to feel good. And now, that Spider-Ham's value is also going to change. Because the value of Spider-Ham goes down earlier on with this deck. Spider-Ham's value increases as a later play. As now it's also a limbo match on top of everything. So with Spider-Ham and looking at the combinations of what could potentially happen with this deck, Spider-Ham's value cres crescendos tremendously. We end up in a scenario where Spider-Ham ends up wanting to hit Hammers, wanting to hit Beta Ray Bill, those big power plays, wanting to hit now, as weird as it sounds, wanting to hit Spider-Man 2099. So that way he just ends up being a big porky pig and nothing more. So... With that said, you need to be careful. As the see the ghost spider gets hit, that just alone gonna drop down that Spider-Man 2099 to being the equivalent of having only a pig. The flooding is essentially now a forecasted, forfeited lane. But knowing that Snow Guard has also put a hawk into hand has got to bring a little bit of fear to the King of Canada, who's banking on a limbo match at the moment.
agreed with the chat. Goose does not show any benefit in this specific matchup right now today, unfortunately for the King of Canada. Uh, on ladder, yeah, you're going to see a lot of big beefy cards and it's going to hold a lot more value. But just the, the luck of the matchup and the draw, you happen to get paired up against someone who's running a bounce deck that stays under the threshold of Goose in every single lane. There's the Hawk down, deactivating the Flooded, deactivating Limbo. Bast goes down a second time, and Spider-Ham re-hitting the Pig, oink, into Jane Foster on five. So we see that Thor potentially going to be going up another plus six. That's going to be 14 into the Flooded. And now the question comes, can you go over the top and do you need to go over the top in the Flooded? Or do you just spread your resources wide and say that I can go over the top in the Jane Foster lane, which is only down by four? And it looks like they're going for the cheek over in the left. They think that that plus six might come on down. So plus six is going to bring 14 into the flooded. If they put down the Hit Monkey Mysterio hood all simultaneously, that's five cards being dropped on the board, which means Hit Monkey is going to go from his Bastet up three up to another one, two, three, four, eight. That's 11 on top of it. And that's going to be enough to steal the flooded even as the hammer comes on down most likely because we see three cards, not two. There's no threat of Odin. There's your Mysterios flipping on over. Mysterio one, two, and three followed by the hood for some secure power. You get an Iron Fist making an appearance with that Spider-Man 2099 to hit into the mid, which is going to remove one card. That will give the murder world back to the King of Canada and the hammer goes to reveal over the top but by sniping the left hand lane by stacking up the hit monkey mysterio and bastard hood gnome holds on and steals four cubes out of the king of canada here in the last round of low stakes is where we move round number four and they've hit that bast so successfully the last couple of matches. Seeing Bast on turn one as a bounce player with this style of deck has got to feel good. Unfortunately, it's not going to be hitting on the Mysterio, so that is going to change your strategy a little bit since you're choosing to sacrifice it into Vormir and not be able to bounce it back either. And the negative zone is a slightly scary location. Power playing out the Goose, which means they're looking for the big ones into the negative zone as Jotunheim comes on down, and that can't feel good for the King of Canada. In the low stakes round, I see Gnome was hovering over that snap button, and I would uh, I would second that. I would second that as they go ahead and storm into Jotunheim. They storm down into Jotunheim as Snowguard makes her appearance. Kitty Pride bounces back into the hand. Collector starts to ramp on up. And with a Hawk in hand to reopen up the flooding, but also simultaneously deactivate Vormir for the King of Canada, you got to look at the plus and minus of doing both. And instead, they go for bouncing back all of their one costs down to zero here for turn four. Beta Ray Bill drops into the negative zone. I like that call. Nice, big, beefy stack. They're probably sitting on that Jane Foster as well. And there's your Hawk. Gnome looking at every possible potential here. Now you gotta be careful with the Hawk in the negative zone because it will deactivate to allow those locations to open back up. But at the end of the game, it will reactivate that negative three power. So just have that balance knowing that it will temporarily be there and then reactivate later on. So you can't factor in that power equally. There's your Jane. Lady Jane into negative. So now you know that Beta Ray Bill is going up to 12. And a Nico drawn. What's Nico's spell? Changing the card's location. That could be beneficial for the negative zone. But once again, now that all players can play in all lanes thanks to the Hawk, 
you've got to look at how can you stack out as much power as possible and probably use that goose lane to your advantage. Gnome is using goose better than the King of Canada right now just because of how the powers are laying on out. Nothing's going to get destroyed in Vormir. And my, is he looking for a little RNG out of the flooded change, depending on how it reactivates? I'm not sure about this hood play into the flooded outside of ramping up the collector one more. There's the Shang-Chi destroying the collector into the center lane, giving the negative zone back. There's a ghost spider pulling over the Shang-Chi into the flooded lane. And because the hood is in the left, that might be enough to keep it. It is. It is. If it wasn't for the hood... If it wasn't for the hood, we would be done here. But no, we are going into the high stakes round. Trying to get that extra power onto the collector in the middle ended up being the backfire because we saw our first premiere of that Shang-Chi via the King of Canada. And now we move to two cubes of pop. King of Canada is looking to try to do the same thing that Kawa did and bring Gnome all the way back to the very edge here as we get a collector dropping into Ant Maze to shimmy into the unknown location. And a sinister London, which could have been huge for the King of Canada, decides to nix it simultaneously into the collector lane, which is going to continue to scale. Looking at the Nico destroy mechanic here. You're essentially trying to mitigate which card you end up needing to destroy on turn five. And I think with the successful bouncing here of Bast, Snow Guard, and Hood back into the hand to ramp that collector up another three, I think we look at that Bast, which has its lowest potential value, as a pretty strong target to be removed. Now, Beta Ray Bill does have the ability to add another plus six to him, but it's not going to be enough to go over in the Flooded. They're going to need something to swing on over into the Flooded. But being that it's the right-hand lane, you can't even Iron Fist anything over in there. They go for the destruction of the Hood for three power to save the Snow Guard Bear's power for four which means they're definitely not looking at playing out the Bast on five. I mean, on six, excuse me. There's your destruction, draws two more. They don't pull their big giant monkey, but Demon holds at least a little bit of power to boot. And the Jane hits the slide over into the flooded, and Gnome is not happy about it. Because that flooded lane's about to go up another six. So what they're looking at is your negative zone and your ant maze. How are they going to be able to defend that when they have priority and can't attack? The King of Canada is looking at offense into either lane right now. And it's an all or nothing into one lane for King. How is he going to take over the negative zone or ant maze? He has already procked off the ant maze effect via the Jane Foster, which had a great, great slide, a, two, a one in three, uh, sorry, one out of three chance to land and flood it, and it landed it. <clears throat> Tough calls here for Gnome of figuring out where that power is going to move. We do know they have the sliding destruction play. We do know that they have a Shang-Chi, but neither are concerned with this layout. 
They plop down their demon, their snow guard, their spider ham, which hits a super scroll. Great piece of information, even though there's nothing affecting the gnome on that aspect. And a bear for 13 into Ant Maze. Here comes your ghost spider to bring back the Jane Foster into the mid with the Stormbreaker stacking on top afterwards, a Shang-Chi that does nothing, and an Iron Fist. And in a wild surprise power movement, we see the Jade Foster come back to steal Aunt May's and sacrifice the flooding, expecting to see a huge Shang-Chi win in the left lane. What a surprise move there by the King of Canada, expecting a super stacked hit monkey at some capacity, trying to play into it, using that throne priority to his advantage, and there just wasn't anything there, unfortunately. They stayed under all of that. The negative zone definitely helped, but welcome to Marvel Snap. It's how it plays on out. Great matchup right there. Greatly appreciate you, Gnome, King of Canada. Thank you so much for your submission. We're going to take a look at these ads real quick, and we will be right back. All right, welcome back. Let's dive on in next, and I think it's only appropriate because, again, they are here in chat. And given all of the behind-the-scenes work that has gone down to make this happen, I think it's time that we showcase, well, one of the big boys himself. Gunny. So we're going to switch on over to Gunny versus Docti, the creator off of YouTube and X that you have seen probably a lot recently. Let's showcase this matchup here. Resize the screen. Get it all nice and pretty. Good luck to both of y'all. How we looking here? Everyone sends in videos in different sizes. There we go. We adjust things. We make things work on the fly. So good luck to both players. Gunny coming on in there with what looks like a big idiot's deck? No, there's a Tuma, Cull Obsidian, Zero, Ronin, Owner. Okay, so yeah, it's a looks like a semi-big dumb idiot's play. As Docti plays out a Snow Guard, and we know that they're already pocketing a Ms. Marvel simultaneously, so might be seeing a Loki-style build over from Docti. Yep, there's a Mirage helping to confirm. We've just got a one, that's going to be a one five zero, as weird as that sounds, over into Docti's hand now via the Mirage mechanic. And yep, there's your, I mean, we're, we're confirmed essentially now because they are also here in the chat. The bigger, dumber idiots deck coming in to start us off for Gunny versus Docti as he plays down potentially a Maximus, which if this is a Loki deck, that's, that Maximus is a very scary card if you don't have your zero synergy, because you only end up feeding the chaos that, well, they're gonna wanna play into. Uh, we could see a lot of Loki on four drop regularly in this matchup. It does favor Docti if they do end up having that combo play out. And there's your Cull Obsidian getting his activation into the White Palace. They take advantage of their zero to play out the gladiator and they end up with the white hot room activation simultaneously. So they're already sitting on eight energy going into turn five with a Mount Vesuvius ready to erupt. Does Gunny feel like he can either A, go over 19 here or B, think that it's time to uh, just call it a day. And that Ronin, yeah, that Ronin is tempting. That Ronin is very tempting. It'd be a great way to activate that Scar one more time. We do know that 
Docti is sitting on a Ms. Marvel, but given the Zero and Snow Guard, you can't activate it into the White Hot Room, so they've kind of plateaued at 19. And instead, they just go for the full stack. They go for the full stack into the center lane here on turn five instead, as they both play out Ronins. There's your Dark Hawk, sorry, your, your Snow Hawk, I should say, excuse me, to reopen back up Vesuvius just in case. So now the escape hatch has been opened for both players to save a cube if they absolutely want or need to. We see a snap come in from Docti for four cubes, even with the ability to potentially run. And for four cubes, Gunny says, bring it on. So exactly, that's a lot of energy to work with. They're playing with nine energy and five slots. That Ronin's only going to shrink. It can't be Shang-Chi, but we could end up seeing maybe an Enchantress, for example, and they ruin their own Ronin simultaneously. A Rogue would just be stellar, though. Take that Harvey Dent coin flip any day of the week in that situation. There they go. Drop it on down for four cubes. The Ms. Marble activates. Add another five power into the mid. Scar comes on down. There's the rogue and it hits the armor. It misses. It misses. Doesn't hit the Ronin in the mid. Ms. Marvel comes down to give a little extra power over to the right. And that Harvey Dent coin flip doesn't go the direction of Docti. Instead, Gunny holds on those four cubes on a 50-50 flip. Woo, that's a big coin. That's a big coin. Ooh, boy. All right. A Nexus is a slightly scary location for both players because we know there's a snow guard in play. So because we know there's a snow guard in play, you can never guarantee how priority is going to go. It could switch at a moment's notice as Gunny loses a squirrel. The squirrel girl pl uh, play in here is surprising on a number of things, a number of factors. Number one, Gunny, who is a hardcore player of Marvel Snap, first off is rocking a base Squirrel Girl. Number two, using it as a proc location, flexible, Cull Obsidian synergy, exclusively in this deck, is unique. It's basically saying, it doesn't matter what you have, I will play my Cull Obsidian wherever the hell I want, except in this instance where Oscorp Tower is gonna to flip over the squirrel to the other side and essentially become a clog location now. As they draw their Cull Obsidian for the first time. Sorry, now, this, now they pulled it on the last match too. My apologies. And we get a snap coming in from Docti again. Hmm, tough calls here with that Cosmo now hanging out in Nexus as Agent Coulson makes his first appearance there. Get a nice draw and sit on the Ronin potentially for the mid. It's a pretty weak mid, but at the same time, Doc D has not put anything into the Nexus really yet. If this is a Loki build, it's very likely that we could see a Devil Dino come on down which would be an e almost even matchup against that Ronin. However, given all of the card draws, and now with a Coulson to boot, 
it's an even riskier moment for Docti as he just receives a snap back from Gunny. Gunny saying, I've got this. You don't. I will put you out of your misery and take out all six cubes away from you right now. And Docti has to decide, is it worth it? Is it worth it to try to take the six to four lead? Or is it better to run for two here in only round two? But no, Docti feels really good. He feels really good as we see the gladiator come on down and hawk for only power into Nexus. Now, you've got a destroyer 16 power that won't activate because of the Cosmo into the Nexus for this final turn. There's no Ms. Marvel in play to give power over because Gladiator and the Hawk are there. So there's no extra five on top. With a two point advantage and a giant destroyer, what is going to happen here is Docti flips on over a Quake, plays in a Quake, switches that Nexus over into the far right with a Red Skull and steals six cubes away from Gunny. Quake Gaming is here at the Snap Judgments League, ladies and gentlemen, sniping six cubes off of the owner of the league, Gunny, as we move into round number three, now with a huge switch of a lead for six to four for Docti. Wow. What a move. What a move. Absolutely brilliantly laid out by Docti. Absolutely brilliantly laid out. Showed threat on turn five. Put a couple of things in there saying, hey, look, I'm, I need to compete in here too. And Gunny fell right into that trap, y'all. It was beautifully laid out by Docti Snap. Two very dangerous locations for both players right now. Danger Room and Death's Domain, followed by a Baxter building. Gunny thinking about zeroing out maybe that Maximus. Or depending on what they draw, if they end up with that top deck of a Gladiator even, that's got to feel good into the Baxter building. But now knowing that Quake exists in this matchup. This is a scary, scary game. Because all of that power can be moved 16 times over. And I like the armor play here into the danger room specifically. I do appreciate that play because you actually end up protecting yourself two different ways on Quake. You end up saying that the danger room is going to be a lane that I need to compete in no matter what. Because even if it ends up getting quaked in the Baxter building and switches the Death's Domain, you're in a strong location. And we've talked about it a couple times in this broadcast so far that playing out of the Baxter building and away from it, as well as playing out and away from your Crown Palace, both can be locations that with that game plan proactively, you can dance around it. So now you've got to decide how do you steal the Death's Domain without needing Baxter building? We see a Loki drop on down, does the full switch, and instead, Gunny says, I don't have a way anymore because the tactics I was going to use, you can't. So I'm going to back away, let you have this. It's still low stakes. It's only one cube to retreat. It's a safe thing to do here. Now, simultaneously, there's another opportunity. We've talked about this in prior broadcasts and prior, prior tournaments. You are bringing Gunny then down to three cubes, going into round number four. From Docti, turn one, before cards are even are in his hand, there should be a snap incoming. There should be a snap, because for Gunny, no matter what, if he retreats or plays and wins, he still has to win one game. 
But if you allow Gunny the opportunity, anything further here, it could be a two game ne necessity in high stakes for Docti to have to take it out. So the single cube risk on round four here at three cubes, this should be an instant snap mechanic. And if you take anything from today's announcements and broadcasts, take that from it. Take these games and this exact scenario as something to learn from. If you have your opponent down to three cubes in round four, no matter what, snap. We don't see it. We do see a Stark Tower and Olympia, which is going to help out both players equally. As Gunny's sitting on pretty much everything large in their hand except for the Blob. So Blob is now a dead card, and all of Gunny's plays are going to be reliant on the small individuals that get drawn from here out. You've got your Ronin. You've got your Tuma. You've got your Cull. You've got your Destroyer. You've got your Scar. You've got everything under the sun. Except for the little cards that make those big cards feel even better. And again, a murder world makes an appearance. And it looks like we're going for the zero out. Potentially of the Atuma. As he does grab the Atuma, puts it into the Stark Tower to bring up to 12. Nice little stack there to get you started, but Coulson plus Quinjet is always scary because you never know what's coming down next. They pull an Iron Lad, which hits the Ms. Marvel, and now we're looking at widespread power threat and potential. They again go on big, and Gunny goes in for the snap against Docti, trying to bring him down another cube. Docti's down to six right now. This would bring him to four. Docti says, no, hold on, I'll stay at five. Showcasing his brand new season pass, Cyclops emote, and moves on. So, we're officially in high stakes now. And now, it's five for Docti, three for Gunny. And a Nexus has made a reappearance. You can't pull the same thing twice, right? Or can you? Oh, you definitely can't now. Now with Mindscape on the board. The only way around it would be Snow Guard. You've got some big beef right there as Mirage takes a copy of that what would now be a 2-8 Maximus. Which has got to feel good for Docti in this scenario. Cosmo's a scary card. But the Squirrel Girls got to also feel good simultaneously as a nice later backup plan. He drops the Cosmo into Mindscape. Coulson pulls on two random cards. As now, Gunny's sitting here with a potentially pretty weak play of Squirrel Girl into maybe Maximus. Hoping that that mid stack is going to be enough to steal something after a Nexus stack. Trying to play into the fact that if you go ahead and quake now, if you have it, I'm protected in two lanes. I've got 10 in one, and I've got a Ronin plus Squirrel Girl in the other, depending on how much is left in the hand. So they're playing into that. Even though they can't quake into Crimson Cosmos, they could quake into Mindscape. So all of the lanes are roughly protected right now on individual lanes in case of that. So he's playing around it. He's trying to make sure that that Pryo stays into his benefit no matter what happens. Even if they top deck to Quake, considering that they just low on four.
Mindscape looming. Now, we're, let's re keep the count here. It's Scar, Blob, Atuma, and Destroyer. All being sent over. So that means Ronin's going to be into a four, in, which will grow to five. That'll add on ten. That's going to be fifteen Ronin without anything played into the Nexus for the final turn. Fifteen, ten, and one are your lane stacks. Docti trying to figure out how to dance around it, looking at all of the reduced costs in his hand, and goes with a Cull Obsidian Maximus Armor stack, throws a whole bunch of cards down on the board, keeps 19 into the Nexus, tosses over an Atuma, Blob, and Iron Lad, yet alone a reduced down Atuma, Blob, combination, Iron Lad in hand, and an armor to boot. There's, There can't be a surprise play from Quake due to Crimson Cosmos. And 13 stack is a pretty safe stack there for Gunny. Docti knows that it's not looking good. They've brought it back to even. It is three to three. Docti versus Gunny. They went big to dump the hand out of nothing, but was expecting more to potentially probably to be played into the Nexus, knowing that there was a flip coming with the Mindscape. But knowing that there were only two, that there were two locations left and available, that's a difficult call. And Space Throne is scary for Gunny. Especially as Docti comes on in with a turn one snap and Gunny goes for it. This is going to be it. No matter what. Both players love their opening hands. Seeing the Space Throne. Clintar causes some pause. And a Mirage steals just a Squirrel Girl. So not very beneficial for Docti at this moment. But talk about unknowns. Now New York drops on down. One of the most precarious locations in Marvel Snap. Making for wild ends. And when we have two players fully in on three cubes a pop, you know there's going to be some unpredictability. And a Zabu into Klintar is a little scary. Shang-Chi makes his first appearance via the pull of Gladiator and gets destroyed. That's gotta hurt Docti a tad. That's gotta hurt Docti a tad. And I like the Atuma pull here. Let it convert so there's no concerns by turning into a symbiote except for essentially what would have been the Shang-Chi. Because we have not seen a Shadow King in this deck. Atuma, Quake, shifts the Space Throne, doesn't let the Zabu disappear, so the Space Throne is now a sacrificed location, even with the potential chance of a Ms. Marvel. 
There's no Jeff to worry for power. It's exclusively at this moment. A Space Throne competitive combo. So Space Throne's leaning towards Gunny. Docti could, sac could choose to sacrifice the lane further by playing or sliding, I should say, the Zabu over. But first, Gunny's going to play out a Squirrel Girl and a Scar. Squirrel Girl and Scar get a little power into both lanes and show some unpredictability going into turn six. Two two costs into New York means that they can't even do a potential double slide and throw in a Ms. Marvel to get extra power into New York. There's a lot of low numbers on Doc D's side. And there's your drop. It's a Scar and a Squirrel Girl. Docti comes on down with Snow Guard for a couple of threes and a Gladiator who pulls down zero, destroys the zero, but allows that on reveal to remain. So you just opened up Destroyer as a potential play here on turn six. And this is a lot of power, y'all. This is a lot of power. Shifting over Scar, knowing Shang-Chi is not an issue into New York. You've got the Space Throne lead. We do know that there is an Iron Lad in here, but there's no Devil Dino. There's no super tall card that can even snipe the space throne off of 10 power to my understanding. I don't know how Doc D gets out of this one. This might be it. This might be the GG you're looking for. Because of the uncertainty there, that zero pull was pretty big, even though they did have a blob in hand also. Does Docti have what it takes to snipe out and go over the top of the scar? There come the cards. Here comes the Destroyer for 16 into the Clintar. The Ms. Marvel for power, reinforcing the space throwing a tad as the bear comes on down. Only 13 in that side. And the Squirrel Girl, with its extra reinforcement from earlier, is not enough to keep 14 there. And with that said, Docti is knocked out by Gunny. Docti taken down by the tournament director. Favorites are being played. <laughs> Gunny, one of the directors and leaders here for the snap. You're kidding me. All right. We're back. We're back. Now, let's go find another match. Let's go find another match. We're going to bring in the pirate matchup of the Snap Judgments League. We have Pirate A versus Pirate B. What does that mean? Let me show you. We have Tucker versus Kamehame Yar. So it is Pirate versus DBZ Pirate going into this matchup. Let's frame it on in, get them centered, get them going, and have a good time. That looks pretty good to me at the moment. Let's get it playing, get it centered, get it started. Good luck, Tucker and Kamehameha. It's a little off. There. All right, here we go. And Tucker coming on in with a high Evo, Mobius, a Lyoth combination into Pixie. It is Pixie Evo Chaos here in round one for Tucker. I love the call. 
We've got randomness every single time. Let's go. And a quick retreat. Quick retreat from Kamehameha, also known as a cool cat. Oh, in a weird world, it's a full information exchange now as a cool cat plays in a shocker into the hand of Tucker. And this is a tough call to decide how much information you want to reveal to your opponent as a cool cat now drops down a sunspot. So it's Evo versus Evo. The question is which versions for each player. If we see the Infonaut also drop on down, it could be an even exchange. Weird World not really hurting either player, but Pixie loses its value specifically because Pixieing would only Pixie what Kamehame Yar ends up pulling. Hmm. We move forward with Snap. It's a newer dimension with a Hope Summers being dropped down. Going to turn four. Planet Hulk gets drawn. And with a Hulk in hand, that's definitely going to feel good. As maybe co coinciding with a big skip. Now, you don't know if you've sent over your Hulk or She-Hulk over to your opponent yet. We're not sure what they may have pulled. But it's enough to know that Hope Summers is giving some energy to Kamehameha plus a Jin. Then you've got a Jin happening in Weird World. We could see a full skip from both players even on this turn. As they pull a Wasp for turn five. Sitting on seven energy. There's your skip from Tucker, who's in the deficit if Cool Cat ends up needing to also do the same mechanic because they're sitting on a sunspot at least. And now we wait and see. They do play out. They play their Mobius into Weird World on five, ruining the She-Hulk potential. And now you're only down to really one card potential play. Which big play do you plop down if you are Tucker? You do have a Jin, you do have a Wasp, but neither of those are gonna necessarily be enough to take over another lane and Tucker has no choice as his own Mobius ends up backfiring as Cool Cat draws it and Kameyameha has to uh, be very happy with that draw going into this final turn. Great timing on that Mobius, forecasting the potential play here. Great job, great read. Tucker has really no other option at this point but to retreat. And that's two more cubes. Tucker down to eight, Kamehameha at nine as we move to the next round. Both players right now playing pretty tight, playing pretty close to the chest. Pixie comes on down, and the worst possible thing for a non-pocketed Mobius pull to happen, Mobius ends up switching its cost to a six. So now you're playing wild, 
not sure what to do necessarily. And now you're on stack location versus stack location. Sunspot versus sunspot. Cyclops potentially versus Cyclops. It's a Misty Knight advantage at the moment in the center as both players are trying to figure out how to compete into the Crimson Cosmos. Who's got the bigger nuts right now? With an Eliath in hand at four cost. I know, it is very tempting. It is very tempting for a snipe here on turn five. But instead, they opt for the power. And a good safe call there as it was a full float from Kamehameha as well. And a free Hope Summers to boot with the Mobius now dropping on turn six to give extra reinforcements on this final potential turn, looking for a high roll on maybe that Hulk on the being reduced down, but you gotta feel good with that Eliath either way. Hope Summers drops, there's your Mobius, gives you seven to work with next turn as Shang-Chi disappears, that big green behemoth. And now, Kamehameha Yar has the lead going into the final limbo turn, and they only pull a wasp. They only pull a wasp and no longer have the priority. Tucker really struggling in this one. This looks like we have another retreat on Tucker's hands potentially. There's not enough power here. Not enough power here. Tucker probably taking his time because he has to reassemble his keyboard after breaking it. And there's the retreat. Big, big Shang-Chi right there on turn six. Forcing the Pryo switch, knowing that Eliath exists in this deck, was a great, great call. Now, from, from Kamehameha, there are there are a still, there are still a bunch of unknowns at this current time. We do know that at the moment it is leaning towards a pretty classic Evo list. We've seen Wasp, we've seen the big three greeny meanies, but we haven't seen the unknown. We haven't seen if there's a leech. We haven't seen if there's a pixie. We haven't had it draw into our hands that way either. So Tucker still has a couple of surprises he's gonna need to navigate around. We gotta be weary of that going into this round. This is the last of the low stakes and a double on reveal situation in existence too. As Kamar Taj flips to the third one. And Cool Cat says, it's a free retreat. Free retreat, no threats. That's completely fine. Let's move on with this deck. Round number five, officially into the high stakes. It's eight to six. Advantage Kamehameha. Just a simple Misty. Vault. And Pixie without Mobius in hand. Tucker's rolling. Tucker rolls for it. Sitting on a Cyclops, sitting on a She-Hulk. What's the first Pixie pull? It's a 3-1 Wasp. Still no Mobius, but a little power from Misty going over to Pixie. which just gets re-exchanged with the Wasp. Shocker comes down. Hope Summers re-exchanges, ends up with her own power value of three. Uh, 
as the ice box hits the Cyclops. Really looking for that Mobius at a low cost right now. Hoping for the best as She-Hulk drops for Kamehameha into the vault. And they pull a 112 Hulk. They pull a 112 Hulk with the flips as a surprise big green beefy beast to lock the vault float energy and that will give them the vault there's their mobius a little late but better late than never and now they must choose a one card win here which i think is essentially eliath for the win play down the eliath for six into a lane secure the lane hulk goes up two we haven't seen any radial way for Kamehameha to sneak into the vault in this deck yet. So it would be a huge win if that was the case. They don't have it. They decide to retreat. And that's two cubes off. And we're all squared away here. Six to six going into round number six. Pretty mid draw for Tucker on turn one. Whole bunch of threes as Cool Cat slash Kamehameha AR pulls the sunspot. Finally get a Misty. So now we've played a double under the curve. As they pull a great combo, their sunspot into Misty, one into two into Mojo World. Neither player rocking on reveal, uh, sorry, uh, ongoings to fully capitalize on Onslaught Citadel in this deck in their decks as mobius now drops keeping a small advantage now hope summers into nebula on weir island that's a very secure stack going into six power knowing there's an eliath in hand we could see a great snipe coming from tucker but cool cat hasn't played a lot out yet there's their Wasp. They're showing pretty low at the moment right here in Mojo World. And with Mobius on the board, you can't really be too concerned with a double play coming into turn six with potential floated power. Cyclops and Pixie just to get a little bit of stack, a little bit of energy. High roll, maybe something to come on out. Because you haven't pulled your Wasp. You haven't pulled your Sunspot. Nor have you pulled your She-Hulk and your Hulk, which means each of your big green meanies have about a 25% chance, each of them, to flip to a lower cost to play at the same time as an Eliath on this turn. As Hyevo drops into Mojo World, Pixie comes on down. You now have centered seven energy going into the final turn, and you roll out... a reflipped six... Back to Hulk. With six back on Hulk, he's your big beefy player to go into the Mojo world and still have that Cyclops proc and still have that Misty Knight proc. Kamehameha knows that he's probably drawing dead. Moves on, gives two, two, two cubes to Tucker. As we go to round seven here. and an instant snap from Tucker. Drawing Pixie into Mobius, not even a hesitation. Didn't even put his Misty on the board yet. And full well knew, you done. I'm going Pixie into Mobius, don't have to worry about it. And with Wasp still in the deck at the moment, it's a great call as Sokovia misses and doesn't hit Pixie or Mobius. What RNG? Removing the weakest card in Tucker's deck from his hand, that high Evo. That was an absolutely huge moment for Tucker to bring Cool Cat into all of the chaos. Here comes the Mobius, even with the floating sunspot. They can afford to absorb a rock right here. As they draw nothing but positive the whole rest of the game. 
There's your one. There's your two. And an extra wasp to boot. Point advantage at the moment over to Kamehameha Yar. As we watch Chucker draw, it looks like a 3-2 Hulk. And a 0-10 She-Hulk on top of it for turn five. Looking at all of the potential spread, Tucker has got to feel good with a pocketed Eliath, a leading casserole into the final turn. This has got to feel good for Tucker right now. He's playing huge right here. And the extra two that floats with the benefit of the Misty Knight on top of it gives a full three lane lead for Tucker with an Eliath in hand plus a Wasp. The protection is incredibly important here because you do have the ability to be Shang-Chi'd in two lanes. You do have the ability to have Sunspot float and go over the top in the Eternity range. There are several different ways that Cool Cat could still surprise our wonderfully pirated Tucker. <laughs> and he's trying to sneak out that Eliath win. He submits. This is it. Kamehameha R versus Tucker. It's all of the R's in the pirate matchup for four cubes here. Waiting on the final reveal. Does Kamehameha R have it? And they play it down. There's the Eliath who removes the Vibranium Mines. That's gonna do it as Misty Knight adds on to the Eternity range, which will give the range over to Cool Cat, but it's not enough as Tucker takes down Kamehameha. All of the R's had to happen there. GG's from both sides as Tucker wins six points remaining on his end to take down his pirating foe. GG's on both sides there. That was a good one. That was a good one. Evo on Evo, but the pixie Evo reigning supreme. That final draw right there of Sokovia getting rid of the high Evo and not hitting either pixie or Mobius was a huge moment. Huge moment for Tucker to get an opening turn win as you know the drill right now hang on just a minute folks we're gonna take a look for another match and we'll be right back because all right welcome back welcome back to the snap judgments league and we have something special for you right here right now this is not going to be a normal matchup this is not going to be your standard 1v1 we have six players involved with this next broadcast this next match we're going to be showcasing ssg nom nom who is beastingly decided to take on five players all at the same time you know why because it's facing the top five marvel snap players sino 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 all at the same time. So let's go on and take a look at Sino versus SSG, ladies and gentlemen. So Nom Nom, good luck taking down Sino. Let's go. <laughs> that was too easy. I couldn't not. All right, let's have fun here. And Sino coming on down with, it looks like, we're looking at another Leech Evo secure play. And Nom Nom... Uh, just opening with a small nebula. Just a small nebula to boot. Oh. 
All right, nothing too crazy. Nothing too crazy. We do have a Kyara being mixed into this here. There's your Infinaut. Infinaut from Sino. He's been hanging out with Ken a little too much. As Jeff also joins the party in Monster Metropolis. As Electro comes down, Nebula, Electro, and Jeff, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we might have a Galactus Gamer over with Nom Nom on the far side. As Magic flips on over that Tarnax, the advantage already leading an Avengers compound. This is tough. This is tough. Right now, Sino, I don't think he's forecasting that Galactus as a Gamora comes on down just to keep the Pryo power into that mid lane. He's up seven to four, so that's enough. We could see Galactus come on down into Avengers Compound. Putting down the leech for a little security. Not a lot of power, but just a little security in your left-hand side. Let's see. Have I called it right? Do you think we have a Galactus in the chat? There it is. There's one card. And it's a Doom. It is not a Galactus. Leech comes on down, but it's a full three-lane lead right now for Nom Nom. right now, and Nom Nom knows it. And even with the full skip, and he top decks the She-Hulk. He top decks the She-Hulk. Wow, what a pull there by Sino, who is now sitting on Infinite into She-Hulk. And now Nom Nom has to try to play around it. So what was being forecasted, I will say, as a Galactus deck, might just be a straight up, at this point, might just end up being a straight up Sandman. It could be both. But we see the Odin come on down, which was leached. So ruins that later potential game plan. But Sandman could end up being a very crucial part of the game plan for Nom Nom, knowing that they're going into an infinite focused style Evo deck, most likely. Rickety Bridge causing potential issues for both players. But depending on if it stays on the board or not, we could see a unique play from Nom Nom if they are playing Sandman in this deck. Now, Kyera benefiting Sino in hand also, who could play around it and use that Kyera to sneak out a guaranteed lane win, but instead opts to remove Limbo entirely, knowing that Nom Nom's not playing a lot of big cards, sorry, a lot of small cards to try to steal the raft. It's not a threat. So we see the Electro go down on three. If you're Sino, after seeing that Odin, you've got to start factoring in single lane mechanics and try to stack as high as you potentially can in at least one of them to make your life easier if we do see a Sandman right now. And there it is. Sandman makes his premiere into the raft. As Enchantress is going to remove that option. No action, just a straight removal from Enchantress. This is a great opportunity for Sino to have stolen a cube saying, I have information here and there comes the snap. That's a great scenario of saying, I have a win condition against you. I see what you're doing. I have a way to counter it, but if you want to see that counter, you have to pay for it. That's exactly what this Enchantress move is going to be able to do. Saying that, yes, you're going to be able to know how to play into it a bit, but I will hit you up in the face. And it's a retreat. We end up with a good snap by Sino, causes Nom Nom to back away. 
most likely didn't have that very diverse play for turn six. Did not sit on that Dr. Doom or single lane big beefy play. With the Onslaught Citadel to start us off here in round number three. Space Throne is no more. No more. As magic comes on down, removes the Space Throne in particular. No movement, I believe, from either side of the battlefield is going to be a... Con ends up needing to be a concern with Fisk Tower. We look up at a pretty straightforward... Location layout right now. Shocker hits the Infinite, which is a great hit for this turn. And now you have to choose. Do you float? Do you leech? And you go with the security. You go with the leech and hope for the top deck. There goes the leech. Drop it on down. Vision makes his first appearance into Onslaught Citadel. And a snap comes down from Nom Nom. We get a full float and Nom Nom retreats. Interesting mechanic play here. As we go to round four, okay. Yeah, it was a straight up nom nom buff uh b bluff snap. Shocker She Hulk is a huge moment for Sino. He's gotta be smiling right now. With the safety of playing magic, being able to float on five and go into it, this has gotta feel good if you're Sino. I don't believe we've seen a Shang-Chi from Nom Nom's side of the board. But instead of going for the extra super beefy double ups, he opts to remove the duplicates. And decides to let Limbo exist as we see a snap come from Nom Nom again. It's another low stakes snap And a snap back from Sino. They both think they have it. As Sino clogs the left side with Misty, Shocker, Magic, and Sunspot. Looking to say that if you float, I float. And I can bring a bunch of cards on top of it for you. Getting the She-Hulk into the Isle of Silence first. There's your Doctor Doom. This looks like Odin potentially coming on down next or relatively soon. There's your float from Sino to activate the Infinite. Now, if you are Nom Nom, How can you go over the top? Because there's your Odin. You've got your bots out there. You're feeling good. Limbo is yours. But you know that the Infinite exists. You know that Sunspot could also go up. You know... That Sino could have put nothing down 
and stolen limbo. If he has vision, it puts 21 on the board, but simultaneously, you have to worry about Misty Knight. Because Misty Knight could potentially hit that Infinaut and tie the Lechugia lane. For eight cubes, Nom Nom goes in against Sino. Does he make the call? He doesn't. He backs away in fear of the Infinite, knowing there isn't enough. Nom Nom has been knocked down to three while Sino is hanging on to every single cube right now at a full 10. And Deep Space just shut down that Misty Knight and turned it back into her Patriot version that fast. And an Elysium. Ooh, this is scary. Elysium is a scary location for both players, as the Iron Lad comes out and hits Wave, making her first appearance. Nice, easy, clean She-Hulk. Can't be upset about that. And a Galactus finally makes its appearance over in Limbo. We finally had Galactus make its appearance in Limbo. Three turns. What do you do? That's a lot of power. Gamora, Vision, Galactus in Limbo. Hulk putting that up to 26. Plus the Cyclops proc, plus the Hulk proc. That's 26. That goes to 28 versus 19. Limbo needs to have nine power in it. And Sino thinks that they've got it. Nom Nom Fist Bumps says, look, if you run this, you probably run Eliath. So let's back away. First cube's finally been chopped off of Sino. And the Vortex puts out an Ultron! An Ultron! Worst possible scenario for Sino! And he pulls out an Ultron! We see a snap, and Sino sees a path. Sino sees a path. Sino sees a path. Hold on. There was a path there. You had all of the floats. You had the Infinaut. You had the Muir Island. You had the Sanctum Sanctorum. And Sino backs away. He had a path. He had the path. And we move into round seven. See, no, 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 no.
trigger happy Sino could have seen it play out. But that was scary. Crown City. Um, Sino's game shut down on Sino. <laughs> Reconnect, Sino. Come on, get in there, buddy. There was a snap included. Come on. No I'm kidding. <laughs> oh man. Sino gets in at the last second. He comes on back and gets that Kyra down as Jeff and Wave make it a scarier location to be in Xandar than it was before. Now, do you go big and hope they don't Xandar? And that's the direction they're leaning. They're saying you're not going to play it into Xandar. And if you do, I've still got Infinite and there they go. Oh, it's only the vision. Only the vision into Xandar. As now, Sino has to decide, I have to figure out how to be playing around Galactus, even though I'm leading in my other lanes. And he leaves Xandar alone again. He leaves Xandar alone again, trying to keep the Pryo in two lanes via magic, there's the activation of Sandman, so there's no longer an issue. We still could see Vision move another time. But this looks to be... Keyword, looks to be... A big drop moment... There's your Doom. Doom comes in. Your Odin in hand would potentially give you eight onto Limbo. Eight onto Limbo gives you that link. But knowing there was the full float skip, Knowing the full float skip. Trying to steal the mid back. Looks to be the call. It's going to allow Sunspot to go up one more. Hulk will go up another two. And that puts another 20 into Limbo. That's a 26 lead. Even if Jeff moves into Limbo to go to 16, that extra six, sorry, that extra eight is not going to be enough. It's going to be at 24 versus 26 if we see the Odin drop into Dr. Doom's lane and Jeff move. This could be what knocks out Nom Nom. And the vision slides, the Jeff slides, the Odin comes down, and it's not gonna be enough 17 adds up to 26 adds the 16 there's your crown city there's your limbo there's only two noms but there are five sino 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 sinos taking down the ssg nom nom gg between the two of y'all that was a good match that was a fun match interesting to see how different people pilot high evo in the last couple of games particularly because everybody has a different mindset and especially when you're going into such a strong play of sandman which in that deck is a very important move i mean floating for that infinite there's only so much there's only so much you can do so great reads by sino Great plays by SSG using that deck, getting some big moments to pop off with that Galactus. It was a great match to watch. We're going to look for another match on the back end. And as you know, we'll be right back. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Now, I saw Suji come into the chat.
for the very first time. So, I found your match. And I'm going to so showcase it. So, Suji went up against Dot Geo. We're going to take a look at their match right now. So, let's swing on over and get into the next game. Good luck to each of y'all. Suji, Dot Geo. Let's resize it so you can see everything going on here today. Whew. As Sokovia tosses both Mobiuses. All of the Mobi have been removed via Sokovia. As Suji's coming on in with an Eliath, Absorbing Man, Negasonic, very interesting fun build, and Mirage on the other end makes this a potential Loki matchup. What are the chances that both players are playing the same cards and both get tossed via Sokovia? There's Silver Surfer and Brood now with Iron Man. Here we go. This looks like the fact that we saw Absman, Eliath, Iron Man, now also a Mr. Sinister being added on top of it. I would not be surprised if we even saw Super Giant in this deck. Let's see what Hotel Inferno is going to burn first. It takes out Ms. Marvel. There's a Zabu, which takes out... Again, their Mobius is gone twice. Mobius twice in a row. Suji can't catch a break. As Dot Geo reflexively snaps. But Suji's still feeling okay. He's sitting on his surfer, sitting on a brood. Also has that Iron Man. Could get two of them potentially via the cloning bats. As Agent Coulson makes his appearance. Now, Patriot, first off, kudos to Suji. Rockin' base, base patriot here. Get a little extra oomph. Play that Chavez. And there's your Loki build. Loki pops out on four with all of the cards and its friends in hands. Zabu also in hand. If they pull that Iron Lad, that's going to be a two-cost Iron Lad for them. But Suji is going to YOLO it. He's got the lead in two lanes. I like the call of send the YOLO. See how we feel going into the final turn. You're sitting on an Eliath protection. You're sitting on Brood Surfer. You're sitting on Iron Man, which really would only be into the Hotel Inferno. I think this is all at this point now a Necrotia game. Because eight power doesn't feel good knowing what you just potentially gave Dot Geo. This is all about Necrotia. Iron Lad comes in, hits the Absorbing Man, which doesn't copy because Patriot was last played. They pulled their Iron Lad, which hits Rogue and pulls Patriot back to their side of the battlefield. And man, they cannot retreat fast enough. Suji backs out. Having no choice at that point. Losing those bonuses was critical. Critical for Dot Geo to take two cubes and move into round three. Chavez again. Chavez again. Uh, 
and there's your Quinn. Quinjet early, always feels good, always feels good, especially now with Mindscape on the board. Mindscape on the board makes that Quinjet even scarier. Looking at the doom in your hand, knowing that it is most likely <laughs> going into your opponent's hand, you're feeding out your Patriot Brood Surfer as fast as possible. And the Eliath! Oh! Wakanda helps a little. Wakanda helps a little bit. So you have to know you're trying to clog the vault. You're loading the vault as fast as possible. Protecting yourself in there. His Iron Lad hits Wakanda. What does it target, though? Negasonic Teenage Warhead, so it does nothing. Absolutely nothing, because it's Wakanda, folks. And now they pull the Negasonic as well. So now they've got to choose how they try to stay over in either the vault and secure that lane, thinking that they might send over the Silver Surfer, which could reinforce that Agent Coulson. Or do they show more strength into Mindscape? Four cards in the deck. Four cards on the board. Plus a Coulson. Six cards in the hand. And they opt for just the Patriot boost only. I like the Patriot boost here. I don't like it in Mindscape, but I do like the Patriot boost here personally. Get those Broodlings up. Protect against the Doom. That's going to bring you to 16 in the vault. And Iron Lad comes down for themselves, which hits an Iron Lad. It's Iron Lad on 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 Iron Lad. We're stuck. And it fast forwards through forever into an Iron Lad. <laughs> All of the Iron Lads come on down as its own Doom gets sent and now Doom times Doom hits as well. It's gonna be a potential tie now into the vault and the tiebreakers leading to advantage.go. Playing it in the center protects against the Eliath. But do the Sinisters and the Absorbing Man clones take over? Because that adds five into Wakanda if they play there. It's going to be a five cost five. That'll put 16 into Wakanda. Iron Lad into the double up gives six, four, and eight. They're looking at trying to figure out a tiebreaker to steal the lane, but I don't think they factored in that other doom. Suji. Oh no, oh no. Oh, they missed the other doom. Suji trying to go over the top in the tiebreaker, adding on another eight power. They don't take either the left or the mid, and that's gonna take four more cubes off of Suji right there. Dot Geo taking the advantage here, leading 10 to three, going into round four. And once again, you're holding three cubes going into round four. Dot.geo should be instant snapping here, even with the loss of Ms. Marble and Absorbing Man via Sokovia. Murder World pops into the mid. As Zabu and Mr. Sinister make their premieres on the left. In a quantum realm for the first time this game. Looking to potentially protect in Sokovia. Knowing that Marvel is no longer a Ms. Marvel is no longer a threat. Not the worst play in the world. Instead goes for the skip. 
Let's see what .go has. We just got Mirage followed by Snowguard going to turn four. I would not be surprised to see Loki hit right now. They just gained three cards all on the same turn. There's your single, and there's your Coulson loading up the hand to full. Iron Lad hits Iron Man. Big hit for that turn. Big hit for that turn with an Iron Man coming down, potentially taking an extra couple of power even in the Quantum Realm could be a great call. But instead goes for the reinforcement in Sokovia while pocketing the Patriot. There we go. Professor X locks down the Quantum Realm as Suji steals the priority back with Eliath in hand. The closest contention lane is Sokovia. It's the most appealing right now to try to secure one lane. Because .go has to go over in one. And going over a 12 in particular, with three spaces to play in Murder World, looks a lot less appealing. That Eliath into Sokovia feels like the best play on the board for Suji. But is it enough? Did they guess right? They did. They target off that Sokovia card. Take two more cubes for the very first time off of .go. It's eight to three at the end of round four. Suji playing from behind now, two cubes at a time. With it being eight to three, it's essentially just four to two. And the Black Vortex is a scary location, as we well know. We saw what happened last game to Sino uh, with the Ultron. It's roll big here with the double brood. Here we go. Play into the Vortex. As the bear comes in and turns in two. A null. And the brood turns into an Odin. No benefit super high for either player right here. But the Negasonic Teenage Warhead is a little worrisome. You lose your flexibility of that defensive piece. And the Eliath becomes a little worrisome because you lose that defensive piece as well because you will reinforce that null simultaneously. Starlet Citadel spins everybody around with a Mindscape to go. And if you hand over those pieces, you give them ammo. So you have to take the Pryo here. You keep your Pryo by playing your Negasonic, laying down your Chavez, Devil Dino brings it on over, but with the hand switches, that Dino goes from 15 down to 11, and the Pryo switches back, the card draw switches back again, and Dot Geo now has priority with an Eliath in hand, beefing up a Null. So if you're Dot Geo, you know you just gave them a load of threes, but they just fired over their surfer. You're sitting on an Eliath. The Shang-Chi is an irrelevant play here because it just shifts the power from the di Devil Dino over to the Null. This is a tough call here for Suji to put everything all in for three cubes, or do you just back out and say, GG, I'll move forward later. 
and they go for the defense with the Negasonic, thinking it's gonna be enough. There goes the Doctor Doom to drop out power all over the board. The Patriot comes on over the top, reinforces those Broodlings, and we end up in a double tiebreaker. And in Mindscape, the Patriot wins it by one. The Patriot wins it by one and takes three off of Dot Geo going into round six. It's now six to three by one point with a double tiebreaker. Whoa. As Mirage steals a copy of Surfer. Followed by Colson. And a peak! The peak! The peak! With a 0-5 Iron Man and a 2-3 Surfer in the hand. Oh, that's gotta feel good if you're Suji right now. 5-6 Doom. This could be a huge, huge big play. Yo, 2-6 Eliath? Are you kidding me? 2-6 Eliath? 2-6 Eliath? I didn't even catch that at that time. I didn't even notice that because of all the effects from the Dan hit. Chat coming through with the big observation there. There's a lot of power that could be played on turn four and a lot more that could be secured on turn five. Here they go. The rogue comes on down, steals the Patriot back away. They're gonna really wish they had that rogue later on as they see the Dr. Dune come on down, remove the super flow as Iron Man comes over the top with his extra five power to put 20 into the peak with priority. And you've got three cards to drop. Sinister, Eliath, and Surfer all at the same time. And instead they opt first for dropping down exclusively the Mobius for some restriction on the other end. Devil Dino gives the prio of Superflow, but the full match lead leads on Suji by one point in the middle. Eliath holds its value still. Surfer only can reinforce the center lane. And the roll on Iron Lad doesn't feel as good, but reinforcing that power via the R, yeah, the Iron Man might be the best play. This is a tough call of how to disperse your power. You have the Pryo. Do you put down both Surfer and Chavez, or do you just go all in on the peak? And they go all in on the peak. They sacrifice the mid, dropping down the Eliath to remove the bonus for the Superflow. Iron Lad gives the peak with a Negasonic on top of it. In the center lane, you've got your Surfer to reinforce that Coulson just a tad bit more, but it's not enough. And in a huge swing of events, Suji has the lead now, three to two. Round seven, now playing with the cubes to spare and bringing Dot Geo down to his final two. What a day of comebacks we've had for this opening week of Snap Judgments League of Games, y'all. These have been absolutely stacked. As Dot starts with probably the best opening combo he could hope for, Quinjet into Zabu, and a great portal to give everybody some love. A sentry for Suji. As nice as that void may feel, no way to get rid of it.
Mobius has got to feel good on this top deck to remove all that restriction from Quinjet and Zabu. That has to feel good. As Loki drops down, man, they're not going to be happy by seeing that. There he goes. Defense applied. And on turn five, they just play the Iron Lad. Looking for some high roll. Looking for some defense. Worst possible hit, I think, right now would probably be a Lyoth. Because they don't have the priority. What is Dot Geo going to do with a whole hand of non-reduced cards from Suji? Titan doesn't apply. Loki doesn't apply. Quinjet doesn't apply. Zabu doesn't apply. This is going to be a tough one. As they drop a Sinister, there's a Dark Dimension card, keeping the priority right now. As Iron Lad hits Brood, big Broodlings drop into Titan while sitting on a Silver Surfer in your hand simultaneously. That Brood could go into the Great Portal and Surfer could drop into Dark Dimension giving loads of power to your wings. Those broods would add six. The surfer would add another eight. That would be 17 power total into the great portal when all is said and done, and that's the route they're going. The priority leads. There goes the brood. There goes the Patriot reinforcing the one clone. They have their Patriot. They have their surfer. What's in the dark dimension? Their own brood. And a surfer. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, Patriot and Surfer has taken down Loki. Suji holding on and bringing Dot Geo down to his knees, winning and coming back with three cubes to spare. Great matchup. That was a wild, wild matchup. Congratulations, congratulations, Suji, on that one. That is match number six for Snap Judgments League today. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, for the Snap Judgments League broadcast, we're going to, for this week, call it a wrap. The stream itself will continue. But for this video portion of the Snap Judgments League, we're going to wrap this up and get you excited for week two. If you want to see this broadcast happen live, come join us here at twitch.tv backslash it's guest gaming and be a part of the action with the chat here live. If you'd like to be broadcast on this and you are participating in the Snap Judgments League, there are instructions in the Discord on how to upload your video into the drive so we can showcase it here on stream. If you want to learn more about the Snap Judgments League, head to the links that you see in the Discord to join the future seasons as this season for number one has been closed off for the next few weeks and we start to already get prepared for season two. This was an absolute pleasure to be a part of for this opening week cast for the Snap Judgments League. And if you liked this video content, please comment down below what your favorite match was. What was your favorite part of this? Do you enjoy seeing competitive Marvel Snap? And what can Second Dinner do to further this scene here for you? the community. Thank you so much for enjoying today's broadcast here on YouTube portion of things. If you're here for the live stream, stick around. We will be right back. But if you're here on YouTube, make sure you hit that like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff below. I greatly appreciate all the support. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.